I, I'm going to kick off the, the parable study by actually uh, using one from the Old Testament. And I have uh, Rudy to thank for that because when I was talking to him about the parables, uh, he brought up the idea, uh, he brought up the, the fact that, that the parables, um, they're, not, they're not new to the New Testament. That the parables were a common uh, device used, a teaching device by in, in uh, Jewish thought that are prevalent throughout the Old Testament. So I want us to study the parables we're going to examine specific parables and through it, I think that we're going to gain not only a better understanding of, of what the parables mean, but a better way to approach the Bible. Because the way we approach the Bible is so important. If we don't approach it in the right way, we may stumble or get confused in it. And so I'm hoping that tonight, what I look at uh, or present to you will help you grow in the knowledge and understanding of the parables. Um, I also have, just so you know, this is a blessing for me. I have September, October, and November. They're already filled up of other folks that have already agreed that they want to bring a study. And December is already almost filled up. And so uh, we have folks that are that have, I sent out a little text to the group. And I said, hey, if anybody's interested in bringing a, a parable, uh, Stephen Lanza is bringing one on the 21st. So uh, I'm thankful for him for answering that. Brother Val Ortiz is going to bring it on the 28th. Uh, in October, Brother Brumbaugh, Mark Brumbaugh, is bringing three weeks of that. And, and, and so he's going to bring us three different parables. And uh, Brother Mark is, is a phenomenal teacher. I know we'll be blessed for it. Then after that, Brother, Brother Rudy is going to bring us a parable. And so I'm thankful for him. And then in November, Marco is going to be bringing one on the 9th. And uh, I know I spoke with Brother Frank. He's going to be bringing one probably either at the end of November or beginning of December. And I'm trying to convince my wife to to consider bringing one and so y'all pray for her she says she's gonna pray on it so y'all pray that the that that the lord lord convict her to, to do that but but no pressure so uh, <clears throat> to me the parables are fun and they're fun to read and study but they also require a disciplined approach i think that one of the most abused areas of, of biblical exegesis is the parables because they're stories meant to teach a simple truth a lot of times people because it can be often allegorized it can be interpreted in the wrong way and I've seen people take the parables uh, and use them in a the wrong way and we have to be careful not too long ago I showed you a video of a, a Black Lives Matter debate between a reporter and Vody Bauckham do y'all remember what parable the reporter tried to use to make his case for the for the validity of the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, the, sheep. the lost sheep. Uh -huh. So as the lost sheep was out there, and Jesus goes out there to find him, that lost sheep is is uh, the lowly uh, uh, black person who has been you know oppressed by our society. No, he allegorized it to the point to where it didn't mean what it was supposed to mean. So one of the things I want to start with this whole study and the series on parables. Uh, I want to set the tone and this is what and I'm going to challenge everybody who brings a parable study on this I'm not interested in what you think about the parables I'm interested in what God thinks about the parables I'm interested in what God says or Jesus in this case says about the parables I'm not interested in your interpretation of the parables and neither should the church you should be interested in what Jesus has to say about the parables so when we bring these parables, uh, and I'm, I have no doubt that those who bring it will do it this way, we have to be careful not to insert our own opinion into it. We have to make sure that we're bringing it in a way that says, this is what Jesus meant, or this is what this person meant whenever they brought a parable. What does, what does the Bible say? What is the meaning or the message of the parable? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight, and I think that will set the tone for the rest of it. Um, th but let's start with something real simple here. What is a parable? What do you think is a parable? Illustration. Illustration? Anybody else? A analogy. Okay, yes. An analogy, illustration. Yes. So it's it's off, it's a story, most of the time a simple story, and uh, it's intended to teach a lesson or a truth. And that's the first question I bring up here. 
what is a parable? It's a, it's a simple story that's intended to teach a lesson or a truth. So yes, it's an illustration and uh, an idea or concept. And parables are allegorical, not purely, but they are allegorical in that they uh, contain a hidden meaning. In other words, oftentimes the parable is saying something, but it represents a bigger or greater truth. And that's oftentimes how, how it's used in the Bible. So that requires that the person who is hearing it process it and discern it. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. just going to say, um, I do believe there's a, there's a scripture where Jesus is actually explaining that. Where oh, he's yeah. saying, right? Where he's saying, um, they say, teacher, why do you teach in parables? And then he tells them exactly um, everything that, yeah. Yes. No, 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 no. That's, that's excellent. Because when we look and examine, um, you know, uh, what Jesus did and how he used parables, we see that he had a purpose for using it. We're going to look at that actually here in a little bit. But we also have to examine and understand that. Uh, it's really easy for us to interpret a, a parable and to apply modern context to it. But we have to first, to, and that, that doesn't mean that it doesn't speak to us today, but to really understand the meaning of a parable, you have to first ask yourself, uh, and I'm going to ask three questions tonight. And one of them is, is what is the immediate uh, author trying to say through it? But first things first, let me ask you this. Can you think of an example of a modern parable? Doesn't necessarily it, not not biblical, but a modern parable, something a story or something that represents a bigger truth. And if not, I've got one. Am I still yours? I knew he was going to say something. What did he say? Why were you? Why do you think he was going to say something? Because he, he he loves parables. All right, brother. Let me hear it. Um, I heard from a wise man um, of a modern parable with a three D image. You guys ever seen the? Uh, the posters that would uh, like you'd have to cross your eyes to see that image. Oh, oh yeah, those three D. Uh... Yep. So normally, when people that really can't understand the photo, they see nothing but you know figures up there that just doesn't make sense to them. But if you look closer uh, and uh, to the picture, you'll see the image pop out at you. And I think that's the same way with uh, with the gospel and how parables are taught is uh, uh, a story or a picture is given. And then when you have the discernment to see that picture, that's where you really truly see the so 3D picture, parable. All right. That's a great analogy. So you look at that analogy, uh, that story in it, and it represents a bigger truth. OK, let me let me give you one that I heard that I thought, OK, this is a perfect example of of uh, what I mean. There was a story, you all know, probably heard it, of a woman who comes to a pastor and she says, I'm leaving the church. And the pastor says, why are you leaving the church? She says, I'm tired of this church. All I hear, I come to church and I hear people gossiping. I hear people with bad attitudes, uh, just people that are selfish, uh, just people who are hypocrites. And that's all I see. And I'm so tired of it that I'm just going to leave the church. And the, and the pastor said, well, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor before you leave. And he takes a glass of water. How many of you heard this story? Yeah. Takes a glass of water, fills it up and says, I want you to take this glass of water. And I just want you to walk all the way around the church and come back. And when you sit down, um, I'll ask you one question and then and then I'll, I'll respect your decision. And so the woman does this. She's asked and she takes the water and goes around. And when she came back and sat down, she said, he said, um, let me ask you something. Uh, when you were walking around the church, did you see any hypocrites? No. Well, did you see any gossips, gossipers? Well, no. Well, why not? She said, well, I was so busy making sure that I didn't spill the water. I was so focused on the water that I didn't have time to look at those other things. Shazam. And, huh? Shazam. <laughs> and uh, just like the water, when we keep our eyes on Jesus and the true reason for why we come to church, we shouldn't be distracted or allow ourselves to get distracted or forget the real reason why we're here. And when we're distracted by the deficiencies of others, we take our eyes off of the real reason why we're here. Uh, you know, so our faith is not based on the faithfulness of others. It's it's based on our faith in Christ. Yes, we're surrounded by people who stumble. Yes, we're surrounded by people who, who fail and don't do what they should do. Uh, that's the nature of, of the broken people following Christ. 
but our faith and our, our strength, sure it can be discouraging when we see people falter, but our faith is based on our, our, our focus on Christ. That's an example of a, of a modern uh, um, parable that can teach a greater truth. So um, go with me, and uh, this is where, where your comment, uh, Veronica, uh, makes sense. <clears throat> I asked, "What is a parable?" And I said, "It's a you know that uh, it's a simple story." And uh, and then I asked, "Why are parables used in the Bible?" And and it's because parables are a simple and effective way to teach a profound truth. Sometimes the, the most difficult uh, teachings can be really more easily uh, brought forward whenever uh, it's done in a, a simple allegory. Go with me to Matthew thirteen. Matthew thirteen. And we're going to start in verse 10. Why, why does the Bible apply parables? Why does it use parables? And specifically, why did Jesus use parables? Why didn't, like, in other words, why didn't he just come out and say, hey, you should just keep your eyes focused on me and don't look at everybody else? Why all the drama of the whole water and everything, right? You know, somebody might say, why not just get to the point? Look at what Jesus says in verse 10, whenever the disciples come and ask him, why do you speak to them in parables? In verse 11, Jesus answered to them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You, well, what is it? It's revelation. That's what it is. We think that we're so smart whenever we see things. It's a gift. It's given to us. That is why the, 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 the people who are not in faith, they seem so lost in darkness because they don't have the light of revelation. That's just not just a clever metaphor. We actually are given revelation. We're able to see when we walk in Christ. I, I don't know about you guys. I can remember before I came to faith in Christ, the stupidity of some of the things that I go back and I look and I go, why did I do that? Hmm. You ever do that? You look back and you go, what was I thinking? Well, you weren't. You were darkened in your understanding. And it's given. So to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. Now, verse 12, for to the one who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. When you look at it in the context of parables, which is exactly what Jesus is talking about, what does it mean that for those, uh, for the one who has, more will be given, and to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away? Here's what it means. Uh, Jesus is speaking in parables, and the people are sitting back here, and they're listening to what Jesus has to say, and, 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 and it invites the person to come and to seek more. It's not just, boom, there it is. It's given in a way that, that incites the, the, the listener to be curious. It, it should spark the curiosity. I want to know more. But the only person that's going to seek more is the heart that's receptive to that. Now, the person that's like, eh. And if they don't immediately get it, they're like, nah, never mind. And what Jesus is doing by speaking in parables is saying, if you really want to know me, if you really want to know about the kingdom of God, you must desire to seek it. And if you hear it and you're intrigued and your heart is receptive to it, then you're going to stick around. You're going to want to hear more. You're going to follow me. But for those who are not, even what little they kind of understood, it will be taken away. Because they'll walk away and they'll forget what they heard, which is very similar to the parable of the seed. So very much the parable is intended to offer an invitation to the person who hears it. And if you're really not interested, it'll come out. You have the desire to want to know this. And that's the problem with many people, uh, especially in our American culture. We want everything handed to us on a silver platter. And our faith is not something that can be just given to us. Faith must be worked out. Work out your own salvation. It takes work. But people are lazy. They don't want to read. They don't want to just... Feed me, tell me what they come to church and they want to be entertained. They want the music to be according to their liking. They want the preaching according to what they want to hear. But according to what Jesus says here, no, you have the desire to seek. Now, notice what he says, uh, verse 13. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing 
they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Well, what does Jesus mean by that? He goes, I speak to them in parables because, because their heart is not seeking, because their eyes don't see, because their ears don't hear. It sounds like 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 craziness. It sounds it sounds like lunacy. It sounds it doesn't make sense. It's insensible to them, but they really don't have the desire to learn. It only takes it only the receptive heart. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, "You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive." For these people's hearts have has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart in turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For I truly say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. It's some about skepticism, doubt and those people who just didn't really want to receive it. So there's a, there's a form and function of the parables that serve a purpose even today. And so it's very much uh, an invitation for us to really want to seek the profound truths of God. Uh, questions, comments before I continue? I know I've covered a lot. I feel like um, sometimes the parables are shared because just like the woman with, you know, if you're saying that the pastor told her, hold a glass of water and focus on that. Because mm -hmm. if he would have come out and said, well, Quit worrying about the cheese small sauce. Quit worrying about what's going on here. Quit worrying about the neighbors. Quit, you're the problem. She would have gotten offended and been like, of course, this is exactly why I'm leaving this church because even you have all these crazy things wrong with you. Even though it, you know, and so sometimes the parables are there so that it's easy for one to look into themselves on what needs to be worked out without the, de the defensiveness coming up first. That makes sense? It, that's, not only does it make yeah. sense, Angelita, it is exactly the main point of this this next button I'm going to share. Me up there next hey, you're, you're, hey come me on me up here. Amen. <laughs> amen. No, 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 no. No, I mean, amen by what you said. Uh, the parables, and notice what I said. Go, can you go back to the other slide? Notice what I said. Uh, that parables are a great way to teach the lost because uh, Jesus used common in imagery for the parables. Uh, so why did Jesus preach to the lost? Because the lost are um, lost. They're darkened and they're the simple truths of God are what they need. They need simplicity. But I love what Angelita said because my next button says, if you notice, they are effective because they are detached. And allow for teachings to be examined apart from the individual listener. Do you see that bottom button there? So what it means, and when I say detached, what I mean is that the guard is, is if, if you're talking about a, a truth and not pointing it at that person, <coughs> the guards don't come up. They don't have that, that um, <laughs> bless you. They don't have that guard up and immediately, you know, instead you can speak about the truth and say, what do you think about this? And they have to answer it apart. And even then it's difficult. Well, what do you mean? Well, like when uh, Jesus is with Simon the, the Pharisee and the woman comes and she's weeping over his feet and she's uh, 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 wiping it with her hair. And and he asked Simon, you know, you know, when I came here, you didn't even get, give me water. You didn't even pour anything over my feet or nothing. You didn't give me water to drink. This woman is 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 crying with her tears. You can give me even a towel. This woman has dried it with her with her with her hair. You know, she's she hasn't stopped kissing me on my feet. Well, of course, that doesn't that doesn't fall well with Simon, but he uses a parable beforehand. He says there were two people who owe, who owed their, their, their master. One owed him a lot and one owed their little. Which one do you think they were both forgiven? Which one do you think loved their master more? And Simon doesn't say, oh, well, this one. He says, Well, I suppose the one who was who was forgiven more. Because people know he's speaking of me, and people don't like to be put out in the. So it it's, it is it, it, when it's detached from the person, then it says we're not talking about you, we're not talking about me, we're just talking about this truth. Let's examine it, and then when you examine it apart from anything else, then it's almost like it's almost like a trick. Like the guard is down, 
You examine this apart from yourself. Yes or no, which is truth? Then now apply it to yourself. And that hit hard for many of Jesus' listeners. So amen to what you're saying. That's exactly right. Questions, comments? Um, to, um, to add on to that, um, most of the parables were, from what, I, from what I've read in the Bible, most of them were with, with that day and ages, like, like the whole biblical as uh, uh, biblical era was focused on agriculture, so you have things like that's why I'm excited about the the parable of the sower. You have things like the parable of the sower and and uh, you know the lost sheep, and uh, it's it's all in, in congruent with everything that that was happening during that time. So. Um, a lot of times when we find new parables like you, the one you mentioned, Pastor, that's that's more of a modern, it's more of a relatable parable during this time. So um, a lot of a lot of the parables that I've noticed was um, so, a, a story told so that it's, it's understandable to the listeners. Uh, yes, here. Jesus used the context of the common world at that time, agriculture and 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 and, and merchants and trade and things like that that people could relate to as a relatable story and i think that's important and when we look and i'm gonna go back to the third button how should the parables be read they need to be read as simple teachings on profound truths which means that they should always be examined within their occasion within their context within the greater context if you don't do that you're going to pluck it out of its context and you're going to apply it in the wrong way kind of like that that black lives matter guy did so you have to be very careful. So these are the three questions that I think anybody who examines the parable should always ask. And um, I would say anybody who teaches it. Number one, what is happening in the story? What's happening in the narrative? Like, it's not just set out of nowhere. There's, there's something happening in the narrative. And that's number two, what is the context? What's the context of where the story is given? And the third one is probably the most overlooked who is the parable directed to and why and if you don't answer that question you're going to get it wrong so let me ask you for example uh you remember the parable of the 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 son who goes to the father and and says give me my my inheritance goes takes off son. yes right goes spends everything like that even the parable is titled the prodigal son do you think that the parable was actually about the prodigal son? No. Who was the parable directed to? This may be this may surprise you. The brother. The oldest brother. The oldest brother. Yes. Jesus, what is the context? Jesus is is uh is having dinner with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and everything, and they've repented and they've come to Jesus. And he's sitting there breaking bread with them. The same people that the Pharisees say, man, I will be caught dead with these people. These are sinners. They were so self-righteous. I have nothing to do with them. So they come and they question Jesus. What are you doing? You're supposed to be a great rabbi. And here you are eating with the lowest of the low of our society. And in, in so many words, Jesus is like, you're the ones that were assigned by God to take care of God's people. And they're lost because you're so righteously over here walking around refusing to and now I've come and I've called them and they've come back and repented and we're celebrating we're, we're eating a meal and celebrating the fact that they've come back they've repented and come back to God and rather than to be happy with me because you have a genuine love for God and God's people you're judging them and me from outside let me tell you a story there was once a son who went and got lost, da, 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 and the father forgave him. Who's the father? God. God forgave them. He came back, and they have a, a, a they have a a, 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 a a feast, and they're celebrating. And at the end of the story, where's the oldest son? He's outside. He refuses to come in, and he leaves a he leaves the story open like that. He says, and he and he and the father comes out pleading for him, come inside. Your brother who was lost was. Lost and now he's found. Here he is. And but he tells them. But but he doesn't finish the story. He, he does that on purpose. Yeah. yeah. Because what they're supposed to do then is like, well, what happened? Did, did he come in? So that Jesus could say, I don't know. 
did they? That's the point. He leaves it open-ended because the, the answer to the question of what happened to the elder brother is in the hands of the elder brother. The elder brother is Israel. The younger brother, now of course we see now are the Gentiles. But in that immediate context, the elder brother are the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders and the, the prodigal are those who have been lost, including the lost Jews. And so when you look at the context, it'll help you to understand how to interpret the, the teaching a little bit better. And I want to go back to what Angelita said because it's so, so important. Parables are detached. Let me tell you why. It is so hard to see ourselves. It's hard to see ourselves. When we look at somebody else, we're like, golly, you know, like, you know, we, we're so good at looking at other people, right? We go, Ben, should they really be wearing that? Or like, should they have said that? Or really, should they be doing that? Man, we can easily look at other people and boy, we can say, I wish I was their life coach. I bet I could fix their life up real quick. Man, you shouldn't be spending your money on this. You shouldn't be acting like that. Man, you haven't called your mama. You need to be doing this. Uh, you don't need to act this way. You're acting a fool here. You don't, You need to throw that shirt away. That just that shirt, no. But when it comes to us, and if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I have a suggestion. <laughs> we get so upset, man. The fangs come out like judging me and we get all defensive and the walls come up just like Angelita said that's why parables are so great because instead of because I agree with you I think that if if uh, if sometimes somebody approaches us and just tells us like like you said if the pastor would have said well the problem is you because you said it and would have left only by that way could that person detach themselves and say see it for yourself now what do you see and one of the greatest uh, talents and skills or gifts that the, that the person of God can have is the ability and the humility to see themselves. If you can really see yourself in, in all truth and all clarity, then you'll see yourself for your faults and you say, you know what, I have these issues. Which means that you'll, you're, you're able to, to discern and, and, and do better in your life. The person that struggles with saying I'm sorry probably doesn't see themselves very well. The person that can't say I'm sorry is usually the person that, no, no, I don't have a sorry to give you, but I do have some excuses for why I did that. You ever met people that, man, they can't say I'm sorry, but they'll give you 12 reasons why they did what they did. Well, that's not the humility that God wants from us. As, as believers, we need to have the humility to see ourselves and say, no, you know what? Uh, there's pride and there's ego in the way here, and I have to be willing to be teachable. So parables take us out of our own way. They're meant to take us out of our own way and to see the truth for what it is. And sometimes without a parable, the person can be too blind to see the greater truth, which is exactly perfect why our next um, our examination is 2 Samuel chapter 12. Let me prove it to you. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> While we're going there, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 verses 1 to 7. Do you think it's hard to see ourselves, especially when we're doing something wrong? Let's find out. What is the great sin that David committed? Y'all are all Bible nerds here. What? Adultery. Adultery with Bathsheba. In, in 18 seconds or less, somebody give me a summary of what David did. He had Uriah killed to cover up his adultery. Because she was his wife. She was his wife. Took this woman that wasn't his wife yeah. away. She was married. Took him because he so busted he after her. committed two sins, murder and adultery. adultery. Okay. You did it in less than 18 seconds. That's good. Uh, so, for about 18 months, God doesn't speak to David. And that's what happens when you, when you don't do what you're supposed to do. Uh sometimes there's just silence in your spiritual life and you know, hear people saying I, I just don't hear God well I don't know are you listening are you where you need to be are you doing what you're supposed to be doing and sometimes it's just quiet right but notice finally God says it's time to talk to David now 2nd Samuel chapter 12 David had committed murder he had slept with another man's wife he had gotten her pregnant he's like oh no I got her pregnant I got to cover this up I know the husband, Uriah, he's he's the king, right? Bring Uriah back to, to, to report on the war. He tries to get him drunk so he can go home and sleep with his wife. So that way when she comes up pregnant, because 
she, he's been off in the battlefield. How else does she come up pregnant? He's got to figure out some way. When he refuses to do that, he has him murdered by sending orders for him to go back to the battlefield. And then he tells everybody else when he's fighting, pull back from him and let him be killed. But I like what Uriah told the king. What Uriah told the king was, how can I be with my wife when my men are dying? And that's really a question for the king. That's really a question for the king. How can you be over here when your men are dying? Yeah. So, it's time for God to speak now. Second Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan, a prophet, to David. And Nathan came to him and said to him, Here begins the parable. You tell me if it's hard to see ourselves. And if it's not true that parables can help us see the truth and get us out of our own way. <clears throat> Great king... There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. By the way, in this context, David is not only king, he's judge. So he sits down at the throne and Nathan comes and reports. Like people come and they give matters. Great king, what is your ruling? What is your ruling? He's like king and judge. So Nathan comes to report. Great king, there were two men in a certain city. One was rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little bitty ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat out of uh, his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest. So this guy had a bunch of, of animals but he didn't want to use his own to prepare a, a meal for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, that's all he had, and prepared it for the man, killed it, took it from him, who had come to him. Verse 5, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. You see how, um, you see how parables get us out of our own way? We are, I mean, let's just be honest. We're very prideful. And when we do things that we're not supposed to do, we always have excuses for them. We always make excuses for what we do. Stop, just know, you know what, this is wrong. I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. That's wrong, that, I, that needs to change, but we're not that way. Do you think that David would have been so receptive to Nathan had he delivered his message directly? Great king, I heard about what you did and you took this wife and, and you killed, uh, you know, you killed uh, um, uh, Uriah and that's wrong. Do you think that he would have responded in the same way? Probably too. <laughs> he probably would have killed him too. Be gone. So why? Why did this work? Because David heard this apart from himself. We get in our own way. That's what parables do. Think about what David said. This guy deserves to die. Would he have been so harsh? Had he been hurt, hurt it directly? No. You know what that tells me? We're so, we look at somebody else and go, good, that's, they get what they deserve. But if it was your child or if it was you, mercy. We're so quick to judge others. We're so quick to want vengeance and, and oh, you know, good, they should go to jail for the rest of their life. They should, you know, but if it happens to us or somebody that we love, oh, mercy. And that's what God has an issue with us. So we're so quick to judge other people. But we're not so quick to apply that same measure of judgment to ourselves. That God would say, would you be willing for me to apply that same judgment to you? Well, well no, no. If it's me, Lord, then you need, you need to be loving and gracious. But with them, man, destroy them, Lord. Rain down fire from heaven. And, and, and so this teaches us as, as Christians that we need to be careful. That we need to have that measure of love and take ourselves out from it and say, what if that would have been me? What if that was me? What would I want? And what would I want for them? Because I hear stories, man. Uh, I see, and you guys do too. You know, you'll see it on the TV. You'll see it on internet. And something happened. Somebody did something stupid. Something happened. And and I guess maybe because of what I've gone through in my own life, 
there was a time when I was so quick to judge. And now I'm like, Lord, man, I just pray for them. Uh, I saw uh, a few days ago, a uh, young man just graduated from college, just graduated, man, uh, went partying with some friends, uh, drinking and driving. Uh, they said it had, his blood alcohol content was uh, over twice the legal limit, smashed into a car, and um, uh, it was a family and killed the mother. Uh, I think it was the father, the mother, and I think their child, but the mother died. So, and I look and there's comments, you know, and you look and, oh, send him to, uh, send him to prison forever. He deserves to rot and this, this, and this. And I go, we all do. Man, I mean, I just pray. I mean, of course, that's a horrible thing. I'm not saying that he needs to be off scot-free, but you look at that and you just, man, you just say, man, I hope and pray for his soul. If he does go, that he finds the Lord there. Whatever happens, man, we just, you know, I pray for the family of, of, of the, 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 the guy as much as I pray for the family that lost. I mean, people need love and, and mercy, but we're oftentimes our own selves. Uh, we, we, we're we so quick to judge and we have to be careful because when we get that way, we, we don't look much better than the Pharisees. Before we can condemn others, we must condemn ourselves. We have to look at ourselves. And so, questions, comments before I go on? I was going to say that um, I think the privilege that we have as parents, um, because when you do see things like that, of course, in setting, um, I always think if that was my daughter, if that was my son drinking and driving like that, um, it's it's hard. It's it's a it's, that's a tough example, but. Yeah. Um, it can happen to any of us. Yeah. And so God forbid, right? But it um it just reminds you that like you said, we, we gotta look at ourselves and um Yeah, there's con there's consequences for our actions and, and you know, if that was my son, I'd say, Hey, there's consequences and you have to be you have to humble yourself and accept those. But so people are so quick to just uh, destroy, you know. And and I think that that's what, what Nathan brings out in David here. Think about it. Who is the rich man in this parable? David. David's the rich man who had all this stuff. Who is the poor man? Uriah, the man that he murdered. Who is the small little lamb? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Took his wife. Yeah. Now, very interesting. I preached on this a while back. I might want notice verse 4. 2 Samuel chapter 12. You ever thought about this? Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock. There came a traveler and he did this to please the traveler. Ever thought about it? Who's the traveler? God. That everybody stopped. Jesus? No. no. There came a traveler no. and this rich man to appease the traveler took the lamb that wasn't his to feed no David is the rich man no Uriah is the poor man I mean when look at it read it 2 Samuel chapter 12 there came a traveler to the rich man now nobody ever thinks about that no Nathan Nathan, Nathan is not even in the story online uh, said lust yes who said that Jackie yes there came a traveler and in order to appease in order to appease that traveler who had a, an appetite, took this lamb to appease that traveler. You might even say Satan. You could say Satan. But lust is just as good. Thank you. Yes. Nobody ever sees that. But that's what happens when we fall. There comes this traveler and we want to appease it. And to me, it is a, it is a reality check in our own lives. And what I'm saying is, is that that in these parables, we look at it, the truth over here, and then once it's once we figure it out, we say, okay, does this apply to me? And a lot of times, like, yeah, that's why the word of God is bittersweet. It's sweet at first, but then it turns bitter because it starts it starts. Uh, uh, yes, it goes contrary to the sin sin nature in our lives. The problem lies. All right, now next one. Now that we've kind of uh, uh, looked at the, the way to examine parables, and by the way, I only got three slides. I, I, I have to limit myself to like three or four slides because 
Because if I do more than that, I know we'll finish. Let's take, let's apply the concepts that we learned. Who is Jesus talking to? Um, what is the context? What is the greater story? And that helps us to understand what the meaning of the story is. So let's apply it. Go with me to Luke chapter 5, verses 36 to 39. Jackie had me jumping up and down there. Sorry. Okay. Yes, Luke chapter 5, verses 36 to 39. I'm, I'm actually going to start in verse... Um, no, you know what? I am going to start in verse 36. Luke 5, 36 to 39. By the way, uh, Luke has many, many parables. I think he's got the most out of anybody. Luke loved to share the parables. Listen to this parable that Jesus gives. And we'll apply this concept of what we talked about, how to... Uh, study the parables correctly let's see if we can figure out what jesus is talking about here okay luke 5 36 jesus says jesus told him a parable that's how we know it's a parable no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment if he does he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old and no one puts new wine into old wine skins if he does the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins and no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says the old is good. What's he talking about? What do you think? Being born again. Condition. Being born again? The heart condition. The heart condition? Okay. When, and that's an unfair question right now because when we read the parable outside of understanding the greater context, it's really hard to understand the, the, the real meaning of it unless we see it in the greater picture. What is Jesus trying to teach here? Remember the three questions. Before we seek the meaning of the parable, before we start exegeting the parable, what is happening in the narrative? What is the context? And who is he speaking to? So in order to answer that, let's go back. What is happening in the narrative? Somebody read verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Okay, so verse 33 tells you what's happening in the narrative. The they here are the, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, the people who oppose Jesus. They came up to Jesus and they said, hey, John's disciples, you know, John the Baptist's disciples, uh, they fast often. They, they practice uh, uh, fasting and they offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours, Jesus, your disciples, they eat and drink. They should be, fa right now it's fasting season. And you guys are just, man, the, the Oreo cookies and, the, well, it's not Oreo cookies, but you know what I mean. They're, they're eating. Yeah, they're, they're, they're tearing it up here. Okay, so the context here is that the Jewish leaders are questioning Jesus about fasting because according to them he is practicing unorthodox jewish customs in other words that's not the way we do it that's what they're saying to him hey jesus i don't know maybe you don't know but but that's not the way we do things does that sound familiar does that happen in the church pastor i know you want to do this new thing pastor i know you've got this new idea but that's not the way we do things and so oftentimes in the church, people get so settled and comfortable in a certain way that when somebody comes and offers a new idea, that's not the way we do things. I've experienced that. Mm. I have just recently. That's not the way we do things, brother. We've been doing it like this for the last 20 years. Well, that's a long time to not do it right. Well, I'm not saying that it wasn't right to begin with. But sometimes, does sometimes the Lord lead us in a different direction? Yes. Does sometimes the does the Lord sometimes open the door to a different way? Now, that doesn't mean that everything new is great. Facebook Live. Facebook Live. How many churches had to catch up to the 21st century because of COVID and there was no church, a physical church at least? So there's a question of how Jesus is practicing Jewish customs at that time, and. Notice the context now. What is the context? Somebody read 34 to 35. And he said to them, 
can he make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. Amen. So the whole religious outlook of Jesus was so radically new to them that the Jews couldn't adjust to it. They couldn't accommodate. Jesus was coming out with new and new ways of, of seeing things, new teachings or fresh perspectives. And the Jews couldn't keep up. They were, that's not the way we do things. They weren't willing to hear it, not because it wasn't a valid point, not because Jesus uh, wasn't making sense, but because that's not the way we do it. Their minds were not receptive because they were so stuck in their old ways. So what you see here is uh, Jewish leaders who love their traditions. And Jesus knew that when we get so accustomed to uh, certain things, that the mind can lose its elasticity. Herbie, why do you use that word? What, why can't you put a new patch on an old cloth? What happens whenever whenever you wash that that new... Anybody ever washed a, a shirt with the wrong... I don't know what it is, like hot or cold, whatever. And it shrinks because you didn't use the right whatever. If you have an old cloth, then it's already done. But if you have a new cloth and you wash it, it shrinks. Well, if you put that new patch on a on a, a, an old piece of garment and you wash it, it's going to shrink and it's going to rip the cloth. Wineskins were made of leather, okay? So they were these leather wineskins. So whenever you squash, squash the wine or whatever, you would put it in these wineskins and they would drink it out of these wineskins. Wineskins were made of leather, leather stretches. When you had a fresh leather pouch and you put fresh wine in it, it would expand because of the because of the uh, the fermentation process. And once it's expanded and it accommodated to the wine, it was as stretched as it needed to be and as it would be. Now, you go and you take this old wine skin and you put new wine in it, and it's already stretched, and you put new wine and it ferments, it's gonna rupture. So you need to put fresh skin, leather skin, so that it'll accommodate to the fresh wine. In other words, Jesus is talking about the elasticity of the mind. That's why I use that word. Because when the mind ceases to be open to new ideas, it can't grow. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And that's why I use the word elasticity. So in this context, fasting was something that was connected to mourning. Or in some ways, it was self-denial to come closer to God. So when Jesus says, look, when you have a wedding, do you ask the, 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 the guest, oh, we need a fast? No, it's a wedding. The occasion does not call for fasting. A wedding calls for party. celebration. Okay. It's party. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me ask you something. When Jesus says, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom, who's the bridegroom? He is, he is right remember John the Baptist says I am the friend I'm only the friend of the bridegroom Jesus is the bridegroom well who's his wife the church so Jesus is saying is hey man I am with them you you fast when you mourn you fast because you want to get closer to God I'm with them they don't need to be closer to God they are, I am with them right now is the time to, to celebrate now the time will come when they will fast. But right now is not that time. The occasion doesn't fit the action. And so Jesus is saying, you guys are so caught up in your traditions that you don't see the, you can't see the forest for the trees. Your minds are not open and receptive to new ideas. And that's the context that we have to understand. You cannot understand or teach this parable unless you ask these questions. So who is the parable directed to? To the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. And it's a condemnation of the closed mind. And he's pleading to them that you shouldn't reject new ideas uh, without first properly weighing them out. But how often, and ask yourself, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad here, but how often, or it could have happened to you, do people reject new ideas, not because they're not good, not because there's not a good point to be made, or not because it's got substance and evidence that it's a good idea, but simply because that's not the way we've done it. That's stupidity. Hey, I have a better way of doing this. No, no, no. This is the way we've always done it. 
well, did you ever think that maybe there's a better way? And so we have to be always open and receptive to ideas. That's the meaning here. Any questions or comments? I have a question. Why, like, uh, like, um, now in our different churches and things like that, they're not open to new, you know, new ideas about Jesus. They just want to stay with the traditional. They like the way he said they've been doing this for years. Why should we change it? But if like we see it, we feel it, we hear it, it's coming out, it's alive. Why don't they accept it? Hey, that's a great. That is a great question and a great point. And I think it it really needs to be answered in two different ways. On the one hand, ideas need to be examined in and of themselves. Jesus is saying, listen to what I have to say, listen to my teachings and, and weigh them and see if it's not truth. But we, I think, have to do the same thing when we look at what's being preached from the pulpit and what's being taught in church. For example, you have progressive churches and say, we have a new teaching on Jesus. No, Jesus has revealed himself so that when they say, well, Jesus accepts the LGBT. Well, Jesus never talked specifically about LGBT. He did speak out against homosexuality, for example, and so forth. So when somebody comes and says, we have a fresh new idea, it has to be measured according to scripture. So on the one hand, when we look uh, at a new idea, Jesus isn't saying, accept all new ideas because they're new. He's saying, keep an open mind and measure it according to the wisdom of God. Now, don't, don't reject it just because it's new or because you've done it a different way reject it because you can tell it's not true so on the one end we need to do that but you're right on the other end i think that people get comfortable i think and i'll tell you honestly uh, this is my other answer to it sometimes in the church and y'all tell me sometimes in the church people confuse tradition human tradition church tradition with scripture and we can't confuse the two and we have to be very careful because sometimes churches can get uh, stuck in a rut about traditions. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, when we get stuck in that way, um, we can we can lose our way. Uh, for example, when we talked about how we need to do um, outreach uh, through uh, these monthly um, uh, uh, harvest events, that's not usually something that's typically done through churches. But that was what we felt we needed to do and what we felt. And, and so far is so good maybe the Lord will open up something different for us but I'll tell you this not too long ago the opportunity came for us to connect with another community called um, um, man I just went blank um, uh, Timber yeah Timber Hill uh, community and that opened up an opportunity for us to offer um, services and connect with a small church that's growing now in a, in a retirement community so sometimes changes happen in our lives things happen and we have to be open to it but some people get so set in their ways, and I would say that that's why. And we have to be careful. That is why so much in the church, you have people that are stuck in their ministries and they don't share their ministries. My, no, ministries are meant to be shared. And one of the things I'm always encouraging people here is, if you're the only one doing your ministry and nobody else can do it, then you're a terrible ministry leader. The effective ministry leader says, whether I'm there or not, it's gonna be equally as effective. But when they have this idea of mine, nobody else, Nobody else can do it. Well, if nobody else can do it, then where's discipleship in your life? Because if you've been given a ministry, you should be discipling others. For example, if I'm going to be out for a couple weeks or three weeks from the pulpit, I think that there's people more than qualified to come and bring a good word of God. But if I leave and say, there's nobody here, pastor, then I fail because that's my ministry. And so it is for all of us who've been, you know, given a charge of certain ministries. Uh, I look at Jackie, she's another example. Uh, she she um, is always open to the ministry, but she's very careful to make sure that everybody is about doing the right thing. So it's not about just letting anybody and everybody. So new is good, uh, uh, but it's not always the best thing. It always has to be examined and say, Lord, is this the way we should go? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that that's one of the challenges of the church. We cannot confuse human tradition or our own little traditions with that and yeah. yeah any anybody else i wanted to comment on um i ran into a scripture this morning and i'm pretty sure that if you read just a little bit above it or below it um, but it's mark 7 8 it says you have thrown away divine commandments and cling on to human tradition so i believe in that area right he speaks on um just everything that you're 
you're talking about. So I think that if you read that tonight, it'll answer a lot of questions. And you need the commandment of yeah, God and hope to the yeah, tradition of man. Our, our friend posted that this morning, and I was like, I love that. Yeah, that's that's perfect. I'm glad you you shared that one because that's exactly what I think she's talking about. Like when when a church loses its way and it gets so stuck, and I'll tell you why because I think when the church gets internally focused, it's all about what we're doing. And I know, and I was at churches where where the conversation when we would have meetings, it was like, well, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, when's the next potluck? Uh, who's going to bring this? When's the next event? And it was never about evangelism and and meeting the world out there. So. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Rudy, you may offer quiet this, this evening. Are you okay, Rudy? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm learning. <laughs> um, Pastor, so I was thinking about the, um, while we were talking about this, I was thinking about the um, the rich young man, where um, he asks Christ, you know, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Instead of Christ listing all ten commandments, um, it was just a simple verse uh, saying, "You know the commandments: uh, do not do not murder, do not, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not uh, bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your mother and father." Is that sort of a, an example of the old covenant versus new, uh, or, or is that where almost like? Um, I think I think that Jesus never uh, when it when it comes to the universal moral laws not not we're not talking about the Levitical ritual laws the Decalogue the Exodus twenty the Ten Commandments they are forever enshrined as as laws that we should keep but I'll make it even simpler than that brother when Jesus says love the Lord your God with all your heart mind soul and strength and and love your neighbor as yourself he says all of the commandments are summed up in these if you follow that. Because everything else will fall into place. So I don't think he was necessarily replacing it. Uh, but I think you are right. I think that when it comes into the new covenant, I think that he was fulfilling them and saying the spirit, the essence of these commandments was not just don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. It was more if to, that if we have a true loving relationship with God and we're genuine about our faith, that will happen. Like, I mean, I can't say that I love my wife and then I never come home. Uh, I'm, I'm hitting her. Uh, never take care of her. I don't care where she's at. They're going to say, Irby, you say this, but everything shows that you don't love her. So that if I truly do love, it says, you know, love your wife, right? Then uh, it shouldn't be hard for me to, to respect her and to listen to her and provide for her and so forth. So I think it's the same way with the Lord God that, that, that Jesus is saying, these commandments are built on the essence of love, a loving relationship. So that it's not, it's not like a, a a technical set of, of rules to follow, but so much as a, a guide stone to lead us into a proper relationship with God. Does that make sense? Yes. That's that, that new wineskin. That's, yes, that's the new wineskin. That's the new way to look at these things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you another one. Jesus and, and the disciples are are, uh, are are pretty wheat, and they're coming up and say, hey, it's a Sabbath, man. You guys are you're grab, grabbing wheat, they're fixing to eat. And uh, you shouldn't be doing this the Sabbath. And Jesus says, uh, the Sabbath, uh, was it? How does it go? Yes, that's it. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, uh, the Sabbath was set there as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a guide for, for humanity to rest and to find worship in God. Not, not, uh, not we were created in order to to be subscribed to this as if it was some sort of some sort of technical uh, device that governs our lives and they had made it so rigid that there was there was a, a ridiculous set of boundaries around it they had stones uh, like around the Jewish uh, civilization uh, civil, around the cities uh, they would have stones that were marked and they would say on the Sabbath you can't go past these stones or you'll be working too hard uh, you couldn't you couldn't eat an egg that was laid by an egg on uh, by a chicken on the Sabbath because that chicken had been working on the Sabbath. That, that chicken was 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 cursed, man. Should be laying an egg on the Sabbath, you know. Um, I said, give me that egg. Go make some chorizo and well. But the point is, is that that Jesus is te is 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 challenging us to rethink things, and that's what he's talking to these people about in this thing. And we have to we have to keep that open mind. Don't let your don't let your wineskin get so rigid that you can't 
receive new teachings from Christ and grow in him. And so God has fully re revealed himself. So there is a difference, sister, between, oh, I have a new teaching on Christ. No, Jesus has revealed himself fully and that we stay, we stay to the eternal character of God. But we as individuals should always remain as open and fluid to God's teaching because we are the skin that, that God can pour his wine into. And if we're too rigid, God, what can God do with us? He's like, Lord, I want you to do, you know, where's your new wine in me? Well, why am I going to pour new wine in you? You're nothing but an old wine skin. How, how can you accept something new if you don't have the attitude or the mind for it? So a lot of times we're questioning God, why won't you do something new in my life? Well, I don't know. Why don't you change your wine skin? Does that make sense? Isaiah comes into mind where it says, I will do a new thing in you. Um, I don't I'm looking for the scripture. I have it up. Yeah, behold, I am doing a new thing. Yeah, and so that, that goes to show um, that we have, he's going to sometimes change it up for us. You know, now, and we have to be teachable. don't change, you know, um, but yes, be ready for that change. Yeah. You want to hope that when you're 90 years old, you're still learning, man. Yeah. Right? Just so that uh, you you know that I've been paying attention. I was wondering, brother. <laughs> no, I thought you had an ESPN. It's here. all good. It's all good. Uh, it's interesting, not just with the parables, but with the straight out direct teachings of Jesus. So you have the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and you have the Sermon on the Plain in Luke. They're not the same sermon. They're, they're like the sermon but viewed from two different perspectives. You have the same thing with parables. For example, the parable of the lost sheep. You have it in Matthew and you have it in Luke. In Matthew, the sermon, the lost, the parable of the lost sheep is aimed at uh, teaching the church to reach out to reconcile uh, brothers who have fallen away from, from the flock, to bring them back into the fold. In Luke, it's a flat out parable about reaching lost people. So in Matthew, it's the lost sheep is a brother who needs to be reconciled back to, to the fellowship. Mm -hmm. But in Luke, it's a lost person that needs to be brought to faith in Christ. Yeah. Christ uses Christ uses that parable in two different ways. He preaches the sermon in two different ways. There are, uh, in other words, the parables have a, a flexibility about them that uh, that allows us, I think, to explore that idea that our sister back here talked about, about, about new wineskins, new ways of, of thinking uh, of how these parables could, could apply. Once we understand their context, once we answer all of those questions, then possibly we're in a position to see if we can take it a step further, to see if we can find principles that can apply in different contexts. Amen. Thank you, brother. That's right. Because we don't want to be so quick to apply what does it mean to me now before we first say what is what is it speaking to in its context. Then we can find it, and then we can extract from it the truth that can apply in our lives. Everything God says in his word applies to us. But you have to first find out what is God really saying to us. And so I think that's that's a great uh, a great uh, uh, point, brother. Thank you. Um, and and so I think this is a great way to kick off this series. Uh, fasten your seatbelts, man. So strap in. Because over the next several months, we're going to have different folks coming and bringing different parables. And they're, they are loaded with good stuff. And... Um, and I think that's why I chose this uh, first parable. You need to be teachable. I don't want any old wineskins here. If you're an old wineskin, man, you need to go change it out. Go to Walmart. Say, I'm here to change out my old wineskin for a new one. So come back and, and um, be ready to receive the new wine that God has for you. And these these are great teachings, and you have to be teachable. And that won't happen until you get that new wineskin. All right. Anybody else? So waiting on Diego to ring his trumpet so we can play for us. No. I just keep thinking about my like coffee filter. Like I, I just like I'm really right. saying it to make sure I clean out all the coffee. Because if I if I don't, it's like you have. I, don't, I just want a fresh, you know. Fresh batch coffee. Yeah. I can relate to. And that. then because I love espresso, so it like you have to clean it really good. If you don't, then it's 
just not it hinders. Effective. Yeah. Very good analogy. So. The Old Testament talks about fresh oil too. There comes a point where oil gets old and stale, and so the psalmist prays for fresh oil. That's right. Not that old beat up oil that's been there for years in that bottle. I'm gonna get a sign out there. No beat up. No no oil. No no old oil. No old wine skin. So, amen. Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to thank all my online viewers too. Hope uh, that this study is a blessing. Stay tuned because this is going to be a series for the next few, at least the next few months. Lord Father, thank you again for this great study, and Lord, this great conversation, Lord, a reminder, Lord, that um, you ask us to remain teachable, Lord Father. How can you pour the, the wine that you have for us in our lives, the new wine, if we're not ready to receive it with the, with the mentality, the spirit, and the attitude of fresh wineskins? Lord Father, I just pray, Lord, that as we embark on this study over the next several months, that you bless my, my brothers and sisters who are going to be participating in these studies, that you may guide them in their studies and uh, uh, prepare them, Lord, to, to bring their, their, um, their teachings on it, Lord Father. I thank you again for this week and for blessing us, Lord, and all that you do in our lives. And I just pray you be with us and you guide us in all that we do, Lord. We thank you. And uh, in all things, Lord, we pray that you be with our church and be with our loved ones. And uh, guide us back uh, Sunday, Lord, as we worship. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Amen.